as some of you know, I'm a retired uh, college professor. So I like to pontificate about certain issues like we all do in academia. I'm actually a biomedical researcher by profession and an amateur astronomer um, for most of my adult life. Uh, and uh, today, more than ever, we can blend the two very nicely through something called the science of astrobiology. Okay, I, I will let Bill introduce himself. Uh, other than uh, what I will say about him is that he's uh, a longtime friend and colleague. And uh, even though we are very good friends, uh, today I will make him look absolutely ridiculous. Oh. <laughs> Actually, we're savvy enough without telescopes and all of that to know that stars are stars and that consequently there must be uh, planets around these other stars. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so they were essentially very much ahead of their times, even though the universal concept that they had then was quite different from what we have today. Uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, it was generally assumed that all of the planets, worlds that we knew about, all in our solar system, of course, only, had to be inhabited because God would never have created a universe without purpose. And that purpose, of course, would be us, right to the point here. Um, before we actually engage in our discussion, and we really welcome questions from all of you any of time. It's not just, you know, if there's something unclear, please don't hesitate. Uh, what I want to show you here is uh, this beautiful picture it was taken by a friend of mine, uh, a uh, rather uh, well-known author public, uh, and public speaker, Terence Dickinson. We were on a joint trip to the Atacama region of northern Chile, which is probably the best astronomical site in the world. And Terry took this beautiful picture showing you uh, as much of our Milky Way galaxy as is possible to visualize from Earth. Now, as uh, many of you probably know, did I drop something? No. Nope. I guess I can't meander too much, can I? All right, I'll stay put. Oh no, we don't need this. <laughs> this is a hoot. Um, <laughs> as you all, some of you may know, this is our galaxy seen in profile uh, because we actually live in a barred spiral, which face on would be like a pinwheel, but in profile, it's like a Frisbee rather narrow. And all of the stars that you see here in the foreground are actually stars that are relatively close to us. And they're in that little pocket of our galaxy that the Earth and, and the uh, Sun and many of the neighboring stars inhabit. When we look at the rest of our galaxy here, here's the central bulge, which holds a, a giant a black hole. It's a very active uh, center of, of uh, activity. But what I wanna draw your attention to is uh, these dark markings. That looks like they're holes in our galaxy, but they're not. That dark material is actually interstellar dust. Interstellar dust contains many of the heavy elements that we, the earth and everything living is made of. And so uh, when we see this material uh, from a distance, it simply means that it has accumulated in, within our galaxy because stars have undergone many cycles, supernovas have exploded. And in that process, heavier elements are made. So they really are, our galaxy is a giant churning machine, about a hundred light years in, from edge to edge, and we're about a third of the way in. 100,000. Sorry, 100,000 light years. Our star, contain, our galaxy contains an estimated 100 to 200 billion stars. Okay, so this is a, a big, big galaxy, not as big as some, but uh, an interesting one that we live in. All right. So the question then, when we address it, are we alone? Well, there are really two main schools of thought. 
Uh, the obvious one is yes, because our universe is huge. It's teeming with life because there are billions of stars and probably billions of galaxies and all the basic building blocks for life, organics and, and the other uh, related compounds are in abundance throughout. That's what one of the more recent findings uh, that, that really modern astronomy has brought to light. Now, what about advanced technological societies like we are? In other words, we're capable of interstellar communication through radio and other means. Are there many of those? And this is where opinions differ sharply, as you'll see tonight from our conversation. Uh, yes, there are, because statistically, people, most experts say there are so many stars and so many galaxies, there has to be basically. And then there's no, uh, the other side of the coin, since it seems from our initial surveys of uh, exoplanets that we have discovered to date, very few of those systems resemble our own solar system very much. So that's the two opposing forces, so to speak. Now, first a bit of history. Yes, sir. Oops. Yes, sir. Ben? Oh, yes, the question was, that, uh, the comment was rather, in, in point three here, um, the, basically the assumption that many of us make is that life would have to be as we know it here on Earth, but that's an a priori assumption that's not necessarily valid because there could be many other biochemistries and other forms of life quite different from ours. And that's certainly a possibility, good point. Okay, now, first little history. Um, in 1959, uh, two well-known physicists, Kokoni and Morrison, published a then very provocative paper that suggested, because radio astronomy was just coming online as a tool for astronomers, that suggested we might look for signals via radio astronomy of other advanced civilizations, since we were beaming out uh, all kinds of signals, television, microwave, radio, etc. So maybe we should look for them. And so in 1960 or and thereabouts, uh, a radio astronomer, Frank Drake, uh, one of the pioneers in this whole business, and sadly who just passed away recently, uh, he undertook the first search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI and proposed uh, around that same time an equation that would allow us to estimate how many advanced civilizations might be out there. Now I won't show you the equation, it's very complex, et cetera. And we've in some ways have moved past that, but that's kind of irrelevant. And I point out that all of this speculation and thinking was done on the presumption that there are planets around other stars, but we had not ever gotten discovered any because it was technically too difficult to do that at the time. Today, of course, we do know that, and today SETI continues to be uh, a very active uh, area of research, although so far, obviously, we have not made any contacts along those lines. Now, in 1999, uh, Ward and Brownlee uh, published a book uh, that caused quite a stir. Namely, they suggested that the Earth is a very rare occurrence in our galaxy. And the book essentially said that, yes, the basic building blocks for life are universal, and so life forms of a more primitive nature may be common but intelligent life most likely rare or not common at all. And uh, their argument basically was, among other things, that despite the apparent Goldilocks nature, in other words, ideal nature for life on Earth, um, it still took on this Goldilocks planet some 3.5 or more billion years of time before we appeared, we as a technologically capable um, civilization to communicate with others. And that's a strong argument if you think about it. 
So they argued then that that makes efforts like SETI highly improbable and explains Fermi's paradox. Enrico Fermi uh, was a very famous uh, um, Italian-American physicist who got interested in this topic, but he made the very valid criticism saying, okay, if the, if the galaxy is teeming with, with Star Trek-like civilizations, where are they? Why haven't we heard from them? Why haven't they made themselves present so that we can actually recognize them? And that, that's been an incre incredibly uh, important point. And then conclusions, well, again, uh, Ward and Brownlee take the negative side and uh, continue to push in their book that uh, we are likely to be rare. Now, the question then is, is Earth really such a Goldilocks situation as a planet? You know, a perfect incubator for life, so to speak, life as we know it. Uh, and you can make a good case for that. Um, our sun is a stable star, relatively speaking, and it lives for a long time. Uh, it doesn't burn up its fuel quickly and go up as a supernova. Uh, and it's li estimated life span is about 10 billion years, not a short period of time. The Earth is an ideal, rocky, water-rich planet in the habitable zone around our sun. Habitable zones are zones essentially, the, the, the definition varies, but the most common definition is that a planet that is far enough from its parent star that it can actually have liquid water uh, in, over a range of temperature from say freezing or below freezing to obviously water vapor vaporizing kind of thing. So having that stable aqueous environment is considered as a key for the possibility of life as we know it. The earth has a strong magnetic field as we know. And one of the reasons uh, that this is thought to be important is that because of that strong magnetic field, radiation from the sun and other uh, sources that could be lethal to life is somewhat controlled because it tends to be like the Earth is a magnet. So if you've ever seen the Northern Lights, Northern Lights are of a visible notion of what, what uh, the radiation can do, ionizes the upper atmosphere. But we don't usually see that anywhere else but the poles. And that's because the North and South Poles are kind of a magnet, literally, for that. So that's a protective element that we have. The Earth also resides in a what's called a safe zone within our galaxy. In other words, we're not too close to the core where there's incredible amount of star activity, uh, where there, is, uh, uh, there are uh, many supernovas which radiate intense radiation would all be detrimental to life. And we're not too far out at the edges of our galaxy where stars are unlikely to make many of the heavy elements that actually are necessary to make planets and life. So these are all reasonable uh, sort of limitations. The other big one that, uh, that uh, uh, Ward and Brownlee really focus on is that we have a comparatively large moon. Now, if you think about it, the moon is almost about a quarter the size of the Earth. But if you look at moons beyond the Earth, like Jupiter and Saturn and the outer planets, relative to the size of the planet, those moons are small. And because we have this large moon, and we aren't quite sure how it, that situation happened, but there's some ideas, what that does, it prevents us, our axis from wobbling too much, like spinning top. And if our axis were to wobble all the time, for example, if we were the planet were to go like this, uh, instead of like this, north, south, sort of in the equatorial plane, that would be terrible for life because the climate would constantly be changing as we get different amounts of radiation from the sun and the like. So those are important considerations we have tectonic activity, which is great because it always means that the surface of the earth and the bottom of the oceans are over time churning, which means that if there is life on, on the continents or even in the oceans, it's constantly promoting new evolutionary pathways 
uh, and uh, that's important. Jupiter is thought to be very important because here's a big giant planet way out in the solar system, which is actually deflecting many of the asteroids and other impactors because they could hit us and cause extensive mass extinctions, meaning that life would never have progressed to the level that it has. I'm not saying this is the case, I'm just stating the argument. And we do have evidence of many mass extinctions, the most recent one being, of course, 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs and 90% of the rest of life on Earth actually perished. But this spurned evolution. If you think about it, the dinosaurs dominated life, uh, the, uh, you know, animal life on Earth, and yet the little meaning, tiny mammals that were available then, the size of rats and mice, were just nobody paid attention. But when the dinosaurs were wiped out, mammals became the dominant higher animal form, and we are, of course, mammals. So you can kind of make that argument. And uh, uh, then the other one, over 5,000, I think the latest count, uh, exoplanets that have been discovered so far, very few of them resemble our solar system or the Earth. We'll talk a little more about that later. Okay, so are, are they then, in summary, are Earth-like planets common or rare in the galaxy? Most of us would argue it's too early to tell because out of the estimated 200 billion stars and God knows how many planets, we know about 5,000 of them. That's a drop in the bucket. And there may well be far more that we haven't discovered yet, even close by to us because our surveys looking for exoplanets are difficult to carry on. And the planets that we do discover tend to be larger ones because they're easier to, to uh, discover. So surveys are far from complete. Are circumstances on Earth so unusual that complex life can only develop and last here? And again, too early to tell because we are a sample of one. And there may well be other samples, maybe not in our solar system, but certainly in other solar systems. And then there's the whole question about alternate life forms. You know, life on Earth, all of it is based on carbon water chemistry, essentially. However, there might well be different types of biochemistries that we haven't even dreamt of yet that could well lead to a life on other planets. And then as we may well be going in our own uh, lifetimes or in our own situation, we are creating, beginning to create synthetic life, robotic life, artificial intelligence. Who knows what we will look like a hundred years from now. So, you know, you can, and also this is my favorite one. If you look at life on earth, very few oddballs or ones of exist because it's always an evolutionary process. And if you have, for example, a series of really bad mutations in any lineage, in any species, they don't live, they die. And so for us to think of that mother nature would propagate one planet with only one scenario of advanced life, that seems highly unlikely to me, although Bill will try to persuade you otherwise. Okay, here's one of the more interesting, sir, yes. Yeah, and I think most people would agree with the notion that if the conditions for life uh, are clement, in the universe, there's going to be lots of it. The question is, it's one thing to have bacteria or even animals all the way up to the dinosaurs, but none of them are going to communicate with other planets. That's the argument that they're making, that because we appeared in the last couple of million years, and then it took us that length of time to become technologically competent to do this. That's a huge span of time. It's kind of a strong argument. Anyway, here's a Trappist system of planets. And this is an interesting one because number one, there are several planets that are Earth size. 
the star is actually a dwarf star, uh, quite unlike our sun. And if you look at comparing, just to give you a sense of what some of the other planetary systems may or may not look like, if you look at the Trappist system, here's the central star. This is exaggerated. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to get back here. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you look, here's this. That's what I have it for. Um, the entire Trappist system fits within our inside the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. So it's a very tiny and very, very different star uh, planetary system from ours. Uh, does that preclude that the, uh, some of these planets that are Earth size um, can have life? I don't think so. But does it preclude that it could have advanced communicating life? Possibly. Okay, alternate life forms. This is one of my favorites as somebody who was both a science fiction fan as a kid and still today. Uh, and uh, to uh, uh, the question of, you know, what kind of life might we find? Uh, these, uh, this very imaginative um, creation, uh, there was a well-known Canadian paleontologist in the 1960s uh, who um, was one of the first, he was a dinosaur expert, and he was among the first to realize or propose that many dinosaurs were actually not cold-blooded, but warm-blooded, uh, and some of them had feathers. And so, in other words, we were going, uh, gradually evolution was going from cold-bloodedness to warm-bloodedness. And at a conference on the great extinction uh, of the dinosaurs in 1980, uh, Russell, Dale Russell was his name, he and colleagues asked the question, if the dinosaurs had not been wiped out by the asteroid, could intelligent life have evolved along the lineage, not of mammals, but of reptiles, uh, not that, reptiles, but dinosaurs? And so he speculated and wheeled out at the very conference this life-size statue of a dinosaur man or person. And what he had done was fantastic because you would go up and touch it when it was soft, it was given, you know, you sort of thought, whoa. And then he had a velociraptor next in size to it to give you some idea. That was a very interesting speculative thing. He did not, of course, mean that to be taken literally, but as an example of how adaptive life has proven. And so even though advanced life and higher animals are mammals or birds uh, on earth today, there's no reason a priori why other types of life could not have reached the same level of complexity. For those of you who are science fiction fans, have any of you seen the movie Arrival? It's one of the best science fiction movies ever. So I urge you to take a look at it because it touches on so many issues that of how to communicate with aliens. How, can you have totally alien aliens that you know don't recognize us as life and vice versa? Very interesting movie. And then for instance, there are possibilities. What might life look like on a planet that has uh, say half the gravity of earth? Well, one possibility is that everything would grow taller because gravity gravity isn't holding it back, even if it's life similar to ours based on carbon and water, etc. And you can even speculate that perhaps life might exist in some atmospheric ground on other planets and essentially don't need the ground or water. And of course, we know of, of no such thing on this planet, but who knows on another planet, or just maybe this is our future. <laughs> Um, and some people are certainly arguing with that, given that we're doing a lot of genetic engineering nowadays that wasn't possible just a few years ago. The art of robotics and science of robotics is frighteningly rapid, and an artificial intelligence to me is even more scary, but it's going to happen, like it or not. So maybe 100 years from now, if global warming has fried us, uh, there might still be. Uh, characters that look like this. 
Now you may ask, how, how do I know all of this? Uh, because um, I have <laughs> unique, creden <laughs> unique credentials and uh, a, a friend of mine who shall remain nameless because he's, he's no longer, it's him right there, who's no longer uh, a friend, decided that because I was so interested in aliens and in, in uh, astrobiology, and I'm from Canada, clearly I must be a subversive alien that has a... All right, that's the end of our slide presentation. And I will now turn things over to my friend, Bill, uh, to give his uh, portion. There we go. All right. It's all yours, Bill. Thank you, Klaus. All right, well. Uh, it's going to be hard to follow that, but uh, I'll do the best I can. So uh, I'm going to take things off in a little bit different direction from, from what Klaus did. I don't have any slides. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I, I was uh, amused at the initial problems that we were having with technical things, and I wondered if the question, does technologically advanced life exist elsewhere in the galaxy, apply here? <laughs> Um, well, so, so the first attempt to communicate with extraterrestrial uh, intelligences beyond the Earth occurred in 1960. That was Project Ozma, which was led by Frank Drake, who was then at Cornell University. And they used the Green Bank Radio Telescope in West Virginia uh, to, to conduct that search. Uh, so uh, 1960 was 60 years ago. And uh, one of the things that's going to loom important in my presentation is the longevity of a technologically sophisticated uh, civilization, because that is going to end up being the critical uh, uh, parameter in terms of assessing whether there are uh, communicating civilizations in the galaxy within range of our communicating with them. So I'm not making any kind of strong argument that life doesn't exist elsewhere in the universe. I believe it's preponderant, at least in primitive forms of life, and probably fairly complex forms of life. Specifically, what I'm asking is, are there technologically sophisticated uh, civilizations out there uh, that we might have a chance to communicate with. And it's a little bit like of all the islands in the Pacific where sailors might be marooned, how many have bottles to put a note in? And that's probably a smaller number than the total number of, of uh, shipwrecked sailors out there. So uh, uh, 60 years ago is when we first started looking for life in the universe. So we haven't been at it very long. Uh, and when Frank Drake, wrote his equation, it was uh, filled with a bunch of terms uh, that essentially uh, involve factors that one might take into account to try uh, to estimate the probability of these kinds of civilizations in the universe. So the, the kinds of, it's not a very complicated equation, but it includes uh, the star forming, uh, the rate of star formation in the galaxy, uh, the percentage of those stars, uh, that might be uh, sufficiently um, Earth-like to potentially develop life of those uh, uh, that have planets that, that might potentially um, develop life of those planets, the number that actually do develop life and so on. And the problem with that is that every one of those factors is unknown. Some of them have been better defined since then, but essentially you're attempting to convert an unknown into a probability. And the, the key problem that we're facing with regard to this whole question of technologically advanced life elsewhere in the universe is, is essentially a statistical one. Much of our thinking is based on analogy. In fact, if we didn't have analogy to go by, this is like that, from earliest infancy, the whole world would be confusing, chaotic, unpredictable, and survival would be impossible. That, that's essentially how we make sense of the world. We find things being like one another. The, the problem is that in this particular question, we have an N equals one. 
we're the only civilization in the universe that we know about. And so it's really difficult to extrapolate from n equals one to any kind of um, estimations of, of what the probability is elsewhere in the universe. But attempts are made to do that. And we have uh, in this uh, galaxy of ours, so many stars and so many planets that at least on the face of it, it would seem that life in, in the galaxy must be abundant. And anyone that went out uh, to any of the uh, star observing sessions at Buffalo Park as part of the Flagstaff Festival of Science, looking up at all of those brilliant stars and our dark clear skies, would say, oh, there must, be, there must be other civilizations out there. How could there be so many stars out there and, not, uh, and us be the only ones? How could we be alone? And that's a feeling that everybody has from, from an early age. You know, it, it's just a, such an overwhelming feeling that there must be something out there. And yet we're not very good at estimating things uh, statistically. So many of the people that were out there would have, have asked, uh, thought that there must be hundreds of thousands of stars up that, that they were uh, viewing. And the reality is the, the unaided eye can maybe see about 3000 stars on a, on a dark night. Uh, so we, we tend to overestimate uh, some of these probabilities. So since Frank Drake wrote his equation in 1960, there's been all sorts of research done to better define some of the probabilities uh, of, of finding technologically advanced uh, life elsewhere in the, in the galaxy. But all of these uh, uh, attempts still depend upon analogies to the earth. So, so that's why it's really kind of difficult for us to speculate on uh, the possibility of biochemistry, planetary systems and other kinds of things, unlike the earth that would uh, provide uh, conditions for life to emerge because it's just analogically, uh, we, we can't really come to terms with those things. So, so what are the kinds of things that we found out? Well, a lot of it has to do with our understanding of the way the galaxy itself has evolved. The galaxy formed about 13 billion years ago. And um, most of the stars in the galaxy, as you'd expect, are, are stars of low mass, like the, the M type dwarf stars that um, the, that the Trappist system uh, surrounds. Proxima Centauri, the closest star uh, to, to the, uh, the Earth other than the Sun, is, a, is a, uh, also a red dwarf star. And these are the preponderant stars in the galaxy. Little, little stars are more abundant than big stars. That makes sense statistically. Uh, and these seem like they might be good um, possibilities. They live for a long time because they don't burn very fast through their hydrogen. Uh, and 97% uh, uh, of the stars that formed uh, with the galaxy are still around. So there's plenty of time for life to have emerged. Now, now there are some problems with these M-type stars that we're finding out. They tend to be prone to um, really severe um, radiation from solar flares. And so they might actually be quite hostile to uh, planets that are surrounding them. Uh, so that's, that's one problem. But there are a lot of stars out there. Uh, Klaus alluded to the fact that um, the stars would, uh, or planets that would form life would likely only form in certain parts of the galaxy. Like, like this, the, the sun is fortunate because it is a, a star that has high metallicity. And uh, that means that there are these heavier elements like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen that can form life. Uh, stars that are too close to the core of the galaxy are, are the supernovas popping up all the time. So that would be a very hostile environment. And uh, other, other parts of the galaxy, like, like globular clusters, which sort of form a halo around the galaxy, are low in metallicity. So even though they're stars that have been around for a long time, they don't have very much metal. So they may not be able to form planets that have very interesting chemistry. Uh, and, and so you can go through these different things and kind of say, well, given what we know about Earth, you know, what parts of the galaxy would be like, where we would be likely to find stars uh, that, that would maybe give rise to planets that would be Earth-like and then in turn uh, form uh, conditions for life 
uh, to arise. And you can go through these kinds of things and make estimates and so on. So if you do all of that, what you find is there are so many stars out there. And now that with the discovery of exoplanets, so many planets that um, the, the varying these various parameters a, a little bit doesn't really make a big difference in your equation. Uh, but what does make a big difference is the lifetime of a civilization. Uh, how long it is from when it first develops the technical, technological capacity to communicate and when it becomes extinct. And we know as with the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs reigned on the earth for 350 million years before they were destroyed by an asteroid. So natural extinctions do occur. On the other hand, it seems that more critical than that, because the dinosaurs weren't communicating civilizations. More critical is the fact that it seems that any civilization that develops sufficient technological capacity to be able to communicate with uh, uh, across long distances in the galaxy also probably simultaneously, and this seems to be universal, has the capacity to destroy itself. And that unfortunately is something that, that uh, on our N equal one uh, habitable planet that we know about uh, seems to, to be um, turning up in spades. But I'll say a little bit more about this. So, so anyway, if you look at the uh, statistics about the way that the galaxy has evolved, it, it seems uh, that about 8 billion years after the formation of the galaxy would have been the time when the most, uh, the, the conditions in the galaxy would have allowed for the most abundant civilizations to have formed. Uh, so we may be kind of late to the game. You know, there may have been all sorts of uh, civilizations at that point, uh, because that's essentially when the star forming uh, uh, in uh, the parts of the galaxy that would have been inhabitable peaked. And since then it's been falling off. So uh, we may have missed that. And those civilizations that formed 8 billion years after the formation of the galaxy uh, would presumably have long since uh, disappeared. Uh, and, uh, you know, 8 billion years since the formation of the galaxy, the sun is only about uh, 5 billion years old. So um, a lot of those civilizations disappeared even before the sun formed and with the sun, uh, the earth. Now, life on earth, and by life, I mean at this point, single celled life forms pro uh, and prokaryotic cells, simple cells, uh, only formed about 3.5 billion years ago, which uh, on the one hand is really quite quickly after the uh, formation of the earth, uh, but it's only been here for about three and a half billion years. And since then we've seen life go through all sorts of stages, you know, the um, single celled uh, life. And then uh, it was followed by eukaryotic cells. Uh, in other words, more complex cells that have the ability to photosynthesize or in our case to, uh, to perform oxidative phosphorylation, phos Realization through mitochondria, uh, and then multicellular life, um, complex forms of life, including things like the dinosaurs, and finally, ourselves. But we have a kind of a skewed perspective, because when you think about all of the millions of species that have existed on the planet since life first began 3.5 billion years ago, this huge um, burgeoning tree of life with all of these species, we actually represent a fairly unpromising twiglet on the tree of life. Um, you know, with, within the past 300,000 years, we probably shared the earth with eight other hominin species, which have all disappeared, including most recently the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, uh, about whom uh, little is known. Uh, so it's really kind of anomalous that we right now are the only hominin species on earth. And it's further um, a bit uh, anomalous that it's only been within about the last 60 years that we've achieved the ability to communicate with uh, potential extraterrestrial civilizations. So when you think about all the species that have been over the last three and a half billion years, and then finally we make our grand entrance onto the stage, it does seem like we're pretty odd and, and not particularly probable to emerge uh, at, at all, um, just from a statistical point of view. 
so, so then the next question becomes, okay, uh, we're, we're here, we're capable of doing these things. Uh, how likely is it that we're going to survive a million years? Because if you say that the length of a community, the length of life for a communicating um, entity species uh, is a million years, then the galaxy should be rife with life. There should be life all over the place. The nearest life that we could communicate on that assumption would be anywhere from 20 to 300 light years uh, away from us. But on the other hand, another reasonable assumption, what, what if the length of time that a technologically sophisticated species exists is only 100 years? If you make that assumption, and people have done all the calculations, then there might be about 14 technologically sophisticated civilizations in the whole Milky Way galaxy. And the nearest one that we could communicate with would be based on the same calculation about 17,000 light years away, which is the distance of some of the globular clusters in the Messier catalog. Now think what the implications of that are, okay? so. We've popped up, we're sending signals out into space. We aren't doing that yet really very much, but we could potentially receive signals from, from out in space. So in order to communicate with a system, let's say on the most optimistic assumption that's 20 light years away, they would send us a message. It would reach us after 20 years. We would attempt to respond to that. It would take 20 years for them to get our response. That's 40 years. Now, if the lifetime of, yeah. You said 20,000 light years, so the messages would be 20,000. No, 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 no. On the most optimistic assumption, these, uh, let's say the, uh, the lifetime of a civilization in the galaxy were a million years, then they'd be all over the place. The, then one, one of the closer ones to us would maybe be 20 to 300 light years away. Yep. Um, on the less, on the more pessimistic, then you're starting to talk about 17,000, 20,000 light years. So, so anyway, uh, so this is the most optimistic assumption, right? But if you're saying 40 years, okay, uh, we've, we've been communicating, we're able to receive communications for 60 years. So we've already eaten up quite a bit of that time. And we haven't yet um, received any communications and we haven't sent any back. Um, so, um, so that, that raises the question of simultaneity. There may be other extraterrestrial civilizations out there that are technologically sophisticated, and able to communicate with us, but uh, essentially they may be like fireflies that are flashing randomly and never in unison with each other. Uh, we, we may send a message off and some civilization might receive it uh, long after we're gone and vice versa. Um, if we communicate at all. Uh, so so the, the fact that we haven't received any communications uh, is a critical point. And it goes back to the Fermi paradox and all that sort of thing. Because the longer that we look for signals from out in, in the universe, and we haven't done that very long, the more likely it seems that the more pessimistic estimates of the length of a, a lifetime of a civilization might be the actual uh, value in in, uh, uh, in in terms of what uh, is actually true out there, uh, and so so um, that that really leads to the question of how confident are we that we're going to survive um, a million years? Uh, how confident are we that we're going to survive a hundred years, two hundred years? Because that's the critical factor, ultimately. And if this is true for us, it may be true for technologically sophisticated uh, civilizations elsewhere in the universe, in which case uh, maybe, maybe essentially we, these are just blips and then silence. And it may be that when we look out under that transcendent beautiful sky at night, what we're essentially looking at is sort of a, a rag and bone shop of dead uh, civilizations sort of um, uh, basically uh, ruins that are uh, standing and crumbling under alien suns and uh, 
essentially casting long shadows in the light of alien moons and haven't had any uh, life on them for endless ages. No. Well, <laughs> some, I, no one's going to agree with me, but anyway, that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> Dismal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so basically the whole question has to do, uh, it, it's a complicated question, but basically in summary, it has to do uh, with the use of radio uh, communications to uh, signal other planets, uh, civilizations on other planets. And, and it raises a number of questions and I, I, I can't paraphrase the whole uh, uh, complex argument, but I think one of the important points to make is first of all, the whole idea of communicating with radio signals is kind of passe at this point. Uh, I mean, that was uh, what Frank Drake and Project Osmo were really excited about doing because it represented the most advanced technology we know of in 1960. But, but the reality is, um, first of all, um, there are lots of problems with, with assuming that that rather primitive technology is what advanced technological civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy would use to communicate. They might have much more sophisticated systems and not really be any more interested in us than we would be talking to a, a child with a, one of those um, can string uh, telephones. Uh, the, the other thing though, is that a lot of the researchers in extraterrestrial uh, life kinds of things have moved on to trying to detect um, biochemistry in the atmospheres of planets, for instance, exoplanets, that uh, is, is not natural, uh, you know, things that might be emitted by a, an advanced uh, technology, which is a passive way of determining their existence and doesn't involve any attempt to, to communicate with them at all, because it's the old term, God's quarantine system, you know, the, the ability to communicate over these distances is problematic at best. And unless there's some you know, super long lived um, uh, civilization of Buddhist monks somewhere that has avoided war and um, climate change and all of these kind of things and, and are ambitious enough, despite their uh, Buddhist passivity to be uh, trying to send uh, a galactic encyclopedia across the galaxy to somehow enlighten the rest of us benighted civilizations. It's just not a practical thing to do. Uh, and, and as I said, you know, if uh, the more pessimistic estimates of the, the number of uh, extraterrestrial civilizations in the universe are correct, then we're talking about 30,000 years you know, that, that's a long time to, to uh, wait for a hello. I mean, what are we going to do? We're going to say, we're, we're going to hear something like, hello. And then we're going to say, hi. <laughs> and then 30,000 year, years, you know, so. But, but anyway, so that, that's kind of the, the issue. There was another question someone had. Yeah. I was going to point out a couple of facts. The Earth uh, radar transmitters are readily detectable to distances of many tens of light years. And in fact, Arecibo, uh, an equivalent Arecibo can talk to itself anywhere in our galaxy. So there's so, no problem technologically in communicating, no problem in the timeline. So, um, but, uh, so if, uh, just to take that a step further then, so wouldn't an Arecibo elsewhere in the galaxy and another planet in the galaxy be detecting things from us then at this point in time. Yes, if you aim the Arecibo at, let's say, something being 10, 20 light years, um, things like uh, defense radar, those are the most powerful signals that we emit unintentionally in some sense in all directions. Those are readily detectable. Woody Sullivan at the University of Washington has discussed this. You can even discover things like the rotation rate of the planet, when day and night occur, all sorts of interesting stuff. So there's no problem detecting signals. The problem is communication lifestyle. Well, well, if there's no problem detecting the signals, then that begs the question, why haven't we detected those those signals from other other uh, places? We haven't looked at enough of them. Well, I, that's true. I'm not arguing that they're there, but yeah. you're, you know, how many stars are within your 300 yeah, yeah. light? Uh, absolutely um, true. Yeah, we, we've only... Survey things about 
yeah, we've only surveyed a drop in the ocean when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the level of our surveillance so far. Can you, can you give a little bit of that? <laughs> uh, yeah. well, well, it has to do with the fact that, um, that some of the uh, defense radar and some of these kinds of things are so powerful that essentially uh, these these can be detected from anywhere in the galaxy, and so um, you know the the problem is not detection; it's uh, communication, essentially. Uh, yeah. Did you know when our team was built? Or built? It was sixties, I think. Okay, and it just collapsed a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so if they have a similar technology. Theirs could have collapsed and, <laughs> and missed everything as well. Yeah, oh, it's just this gigantic uh, radar dish that's built in in a, a natural kind of uh, an amphitheater in Puerto Rico, and and it was the the world's largest radio telescope for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 it's just it's a big radar dish basically. And it's been used for a lot of investigations. Yeah. Does the equation, I forget the gentleman's name, develop the displacing factor? And I'll introduce it this way. Do you know what the ratio is between the number of stars in this galaxy to the number of galaxies? Um, I'm not sure what the significance of that ratio would be in that Meaning sense. That you're limiting yourself a thinking outside the box. About this galaxy, and my understanding is there's an awful lot of galaxies. Oh, oh right, so right, right. Probability of life. Oh, oh, right, right. No, 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 no question about that. And and the, the but in terms of the practicality of communication, you know, it, uh, as Klaus said, I mean, our galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across. Um, you know, the Andromeda spiral is two million light years. And, and so, you know, it, it, all of these other systems may well, you know, have, have uh, a preponderance of life forms and, and uh, civilizations, but from the standpoint of our detecting them or, you know, communicating it, the, the chances are nil for the same reasons, namely, uh, you know, it would take forever for a civilization to send a message that we could pick up and, and then for us to respond to it. So. And, and then, of course, you get into the fact that the galaxies in the universe have been evolving. So probably early, early in the universe, in which we're now starting to be able to get some good images of with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, at that time, probably uh, planets hadn't been, uh, stars and planets hadn't been around long enough to develop life. Uh, and then also the, the early universe was really crowded and, and a lot of the galaxies are merging and these are very hostile environments. You know, lots of, lots of these uh, merging galaxies uh, are called exploding galaxies because they, they're, they're so, uh, such violent places. Uh, and first generations of stars wouldn't, be, wouldn't have any metallicity. I mean, any of these heavier elements, so life couldn't form there. But yeah, in, in our part of the universe, uh, other galaxies should have the same um, likelihood of forming life as, as our galaxy. It's just that they're too far away to be of practical interest. All right. Can Klaus just make a comment? <laughs> don't, don't go away. Um, I think that uh, part of the problem is that the Drake equation and the enthusiasm about SETI that it generated uh, really uh, was naive in retrospect. Uh, and it kind of led to, you know, the Star Trek notion of civilizations that, uh, you know, once you can travel at the speed of light or faster, you're bound to run into many, many advanced civilizations. And I think that has sort of colored the um, perception, certainly in the public mind, and I don't know what it did in my mind, that uh, there must be advanced life in many, many places in the galaxy. I'm not denying, I'm not quite as pessimistic as Bill is in that regard, or as Bill has stated he is, um, 
I think what we still lack incredibly a lot of is data. Just to give you an example, the SETI people will tell you that initially we began by uh, looking at the 21 centimeter wavelength uh, of radio signal because that was a quiet portion of the radio spectrum. In other words, there wasn't so much background noise. And the rationale was that any advanced civilization would figure that out and then transmit in that range of frequency. The other positive thing about that is that that's also where much of the, uh, they called it the water window as well, because that's where ionized water signals can be detected around 21 centimeters. So that all seemed to make a whole bunch of, of uh, sense. I think today uh, what's become apparent is that there is a near infinity of channels electromagnetic channels that anybody could use to communicate intentionally or otherwise. And we don't have the technology to monitor all of this adequately. And so from that standpoint, I think what the best um, strategy for SETI type programs, and, and I know they're heading in that direction, is to do the broadest survey irrespective of where it might be coming from and continue to scan to, to see if we'll pick up uh, something that resembles an intelligent signal. We wouldn't necessarily be able to communicate back with them if it's let's say a thousand light years from us, uh, you know, or a thousand light years is the duration of the Roman empire, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but I think it might give us a better indication uh, rather than trying to target promising, we should do that too, promising star systems, but a broader approach simply to listen. Uh, you know, if, if you go out in, in nature uh, and you're listening for, if you're a birder and you're listening for birds singing, you're not going to go to one tree and say, I think that's where I might find that bird or the other tree. And I, no, you're going to listen broadly until you hear something and then you'll home in on. Now, to me, that would be the, the best strategy to undertake for SETI. The other. You know, um, I'd like to say that you don't have any more comments to add. Um, let's wrap it up after that, and then we want to stay and ask questions. Uh, I think that'd be a good way of uh, ending the hearing. Okay. Thank you. Not a, not a problem. Did you want to add yeah, something? Just one last thing. It's going to be a short comment, but uh, in the absence of data, one of the things that we tend to do is we use sort of broad philosophical themes in order to inform our arguments. And there are two things that Klaus had alluded to just now that are kind of at odds with each other. The first is what's called the Copernican principle. And that's the idea that is associated with Nicholas Copernicus, who showed that the earth is an ordinary planet revolving around the sun that there isn't anything special about us. So if, if life and intelligent life developed on the earth, there's no reason to think that we're so special that that's the only place where it exists. But opposed to that is the anthropocentric tendency that we have, namely to look at ourselves as somehow special. And I think that's one of the things that emerges in this whole thing. And what Klaus was saying about the Star Trek scenario is part of that. We have to realize that we are one of over 6,000, about 6,900 mammalian species that exist on the planet right now. We're the only hominin species that exists on the planet right now. Even under our watch, 96 mammalian species have become extinct. That's within the time that humans have been in charge of things here, if you want to say that. And, and so, there's nothing really very special about us in, in that sense. There's no reason to think that elsewhere in the galaxy, uh, similar types of, of um, uh, species exist. That, that's a very uh, flattering egocentric view. And by the same token, if, as seems unfortunately to my somewhat pessimistic gaze, 
we become extinct in the next 50 or 100 years, our loss will be no more keenly felt by the earth, the solar system, the universe, than the loss of any of those other 96 mammalian species that have disappeared in a very short time or the other hominin species that have disappeared over the last 50 or 100,000 years. And if our signals go dark, there's no one in the galaxies uh, that is going to miss us, unfortunately. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs>